Uh, I have a question about uh, machine learning and uh, DevOps together because you talked about the machine learning. Uh, do you have some uh, methodologies that you use machine learning with uh, DevOps operations? Because if you replace human with tools, uh, tools also need to learn uh, uh, because you are always getting software updates, operating system updates, etc. I'm very glad you asked this question. <laughs> We're starting to use machine learning for hops operation right now. Basically what we do is analyzing logs and all the monitoring data. And we have also another, another software we don't speak a lot about because it's, it's, it's not ready to be shown to the world, but it's something when, you, when you're pushing some code, we analyze what is your dependencies. So if you're using Java, you know you're using JSON for JSON uh, marshalling. We know we're using this version of Hibernate and thing, and we, we establish a graph of the dependencies and be able to see the graph evolving. So basically, we're pushing all this data inside the machine learning, and what, what we want to get some news is this kind of advice. Each time uh, um, there is this kind of logs and monitoring, the application go to crash. So we know the application will crash in a 10 minutes, just restart it right now without downtime. It will be better. First thing we can have with machine learning. All the things are very much interesting for the users. All of the people going from the version 2 to the version 3 of these dependencies are very short code modification between the two. So we think it's really easy for you to change and going updated your dependencies. And these dependencies have a security TLX node. So basically do it right now. It is kind of stuff we can do with machine learning because you know we have so much application running there. So we are able to to, to collect all of this. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, and uh, do not hesitate to to ping me uh, in the conference. I'm here today. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you will need this. Maybe. I think you will need this. Is it yours? It's mine. But I'm just sitting right there. Okay. I'll give it back to you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Mr. Yago Lopez Galerias. His uh, speech is entitled RKT What's Coming Next? Okay. So, hello. Um, I'm here today to talk about Rocket and uh, where, where, where are we now in Rocket development and where are we going. So first, some introduction. My name is Iago Lopez and I live currently in Berlin. Uh, I, I work at Kimfolk there and I'm actually one of the co-founders. So what we do, we are a small company and we do open source consultancy. We work ex exclusively in open source. And for some time now, we've been working together with CoreOS in building, building Rocket. And uh, yeah, I'm currently uh, uh, one of the maintainers, along with Alban, which is one of my colleagues, and some other people from CoreOS. So the plan for this talk is, first, we'll talk a bit about what is Rocket, for those of you who don't, who don't know, we're not familiar with Rocket. And uh, how does Rocket work? We will, uh, I will give a, a brief explanation of how it works. Uh, then I will talk about uh, how Rocket loves Kubernetes, how Rocket can help Kubernetes. And uh, we've released that version 1.0 of Rocket on February, so I will talk a bit about uh, what new things we developed since then. And uh, finally, uh, what's coming, so what are our plans for, for uh, the next months. So, uh, yeah, by the way, you will notice that I changed the style of, of the slides. That's because I, I like stealing slides from my colleagues. 
and I'm not ashamed about it, so I'll, I'll just uh, don't hide it. <laughs> so Rocket. Uh, Rocket is a, a modern, secure, and composable uh, container runtime. Modern as in we are trying to use the latest technologies on, on Linux. Uh, secure as in we, we try to be secure by default, uh, forcing users to opt out of security if they, if they want to get rid of it. And composable because we try to play nice with the environment we are, we are in and also internally composable, as in we, we like to, to be modular and, be in, and have parts that uh, can be swapped out. Uh, more, more on that uh, a bit later. So uh, Rocket is an implementation of the, of the AppSea spec. Uh, uh, yeah, more, um, yeah, the image format and execution environment parts mostly. So I will give a brief uh, introduction to AppSea. So AppSea is a standard for application containers, and it's a GitHub organization with several projects. And the main part I'm going to be focusing on now is the, the specification for container images. Um, so yeah, as I said before, it's a GitHub organization. It has uh, several uh, repositories there in the AppSea. And I've been talking about the spec and maybe a bit about CNI, which we moved to container networking uh, because it was yeah, outgrowing AppSea. So in a nutshell, AppSea uh, defines four things. Uh, an image format, which tells you uh, what, uh, what an application consists of, basically a tarball and some information in a manifest uh, about it. Um, it also defines uh, an image discovery protocol, which is how you go from the name of your app to where the actual artifacts are, like the, the, the actual tarball and signature and so on. And it defines the concept of pods, which is how apps are grouped on, I mean, are grouped and, and run. And of course, the executor runtime uh, part, which is uh, what the app running in your container is expecting. So yeah, now let's talk about Rocket. It's a simple CLI tool. Uh, it's written in Golang and it runs on, on Linux. Uh, it is self-contained. Uh, that means that it doesn't require a lot of dependencies, just a glibc and everything should work. And it is in its system and distro agnostic. It can run on, on anything, and if it doesn't, please find an issue. Uh, although we heavily recommend systemd and we use it internally in Rocket. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to, to use it. Um, so a simple CLI tool. That means that there's no daemon, uh, like in, in Docker, for example. Uh, I said there's no daemon, but it, there's no mandatory daemon. Uh, more on that later. So apps run directly under the spawning process. That is, if you have a, a bash or our unit or a systemd unit, you execute Rocket. Rocket is uh, directly under it, and applications uh, are also directly under it. So that means that all the limits that you apply to, that, that the bash or systemd applies to your application propagate directly to the app, so the app has to, to follow those, those limits. So internally, uh, we wanted to have a modular uh, design, so we divided Rocket in, in several stages, and there's three of them. So this, this will be basically a more detailed picture of what I showed before. Uh, Rocket is the stage zero, and then there's the pod, which is the isolation part, and then apps inside each pod. So let's talk about stage zero first. Uh, stage zero is basically the Rocket binary, and uh, it deals with discovering the images, what I said before on, on the AppSea spec, uh, uh, fetching images, managing uh, the images. With this, it sets up the pod file systems, and it has the usual commands you should you would expect from a container runtime, like running, listing, and, and whatnot. Uh, now uh, to stage one. Stage one is the actual container. It's uh, the execution environment for the pods, and it's what actually provides the isolation from the rest of the system. It manages the, the life cycle of the uh, app processes, and it can also enforce uh, resource constraints, which we call isolators. And as I said before, we, we wanted to do this in a very modular way, so you can swap uh, uh, parts of Rocket. And in this case, stage one has a default implementation, which is uh, the, basically a container, uh, and it uses systemd and spawn for containerization, and systemd inside uh, this container to manage all the app processes. 
So yeah, Linux containers are, are basically Linux namespaces and C groups, um, and that's what uh, Rocket uses by default. Uh, there's also a KVM implementation, which implements real hardware isolation, and it is based uh, on LKVM, which is uh, um, a version of KVM that runs Linux hosts, Linux guests on Linux hosts, and also systemd inside to manage all the app processes. And there might be others. Uh, there's a QMU pull request available now because KVM has some problems and we are trying to, to use QMU to, to see if they solve the problems. Um, there can be uh, many implementations. Those are not yet uh, uh, explored, like XHive for OS X, which is the native virtualization framework for OS X. UNC for unprivileged con containers or bubble wrap, which is some uh, some project by Red Hat that is that lo looks pretty interesting. Uh, I won't talk much about it now. Uh, so yeah, another change of, of slide style. Uh, then there's a the stage two, and stage two is basically your app. So it's uh, each app in a stage one is uh, is it has an independent file system. So the apps have uh, an independent view of each other. Uh, this is not an, an, an isolation uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, we originally used chroot, and now we use a, a mount namespace. I will talk a bit more about that, that later. But basically, you shouldn't uh, rely on that for isolation. So apps in, in, each, in the pod are not isolated from each other. And yeah, uh, all the stage, one, uh, the stage two apps uh, share namespace, volumes, IPC, and, and everything. So I wanted to talk a bit more about security, uh, this secure by default thing I was talking before. Uh, for example, we enforce image signature verification. The user has to write a pretty long command line to disable that. So we think that that's pretty important to, to trust what container image you are running. Um, we try to do privilege separation, so you don't need root to fetch images. You have a read-only API that runs as non-root, so you can get information about what you're running. Um, we've been working recently on SLinux integration, which mostly work, except some uh, bug kernel bug on, on uh, when trying to use SLinux in over, on OverlayFS, and the Red Hat guys are working on that. And yeah, as, as I mentioned before, the KVM stage one for hardware isolation, uh, that's when, when you need uh, yeah, a stronger security uh, than con just containers. And there's this TPM attestation feature. Um, so TPM is a trusted platform module. It's a hardware module that stores cryptographic keys. And it can be used to measure the state of the system. Uh, that is, you can verify from the bootloader time that you are running what you, what, what you actually think you're running. And if you're not running that, you can just uh, not trust this machine anymore. So Core has the support for, for TPM on Grub, so they can verify the bootloader. And building up on that, uh, Rocket can, also, can now record information about the pods you run and all the arguments that are passed and the images. So you can uh, always know uh, what, what images and, and are you, you are running in, in a system or have been run in a system. And this API service I've, I talked before, uh, it's an optional daemon based on gRPC. And it exposes read-only information about pod images, basically what images are running, what, what not pods are running, runs as an unprivileged user. And we build that because you don't usually want to uh, fork Rocket, uh, to do Rocket list to know which pods are running. That's very expensive. So uh, it's better to have some service that can understand uh, Rocket's format and can expose this information to, to other app applications. And then uh, I want to talk a bit about Rocket Networking. It's plugin based. Uh, it basically gives you an IP or several IPs per pod. And it's using the CNI con container networking interface, which was the way that Rocket was doing networking before. And, and now we, we forked off a new project. Uh, and it's used by Rocket, Kurma, Kubernetes, Weaveworks, if you know that, Calico. So it's getting pretty good traction. So basically, it's a, an interface that executes binary plugins. Uh, so the runtime just uh, calls the, this interface. And you can have several plugins like PDP, point-to-point -point network, MacVillan, 
IPVLAN, OpenV switch, and, and so on, Flannel. So basically, a pod can join multiple networks. These networks are described on a JSON uh, configure file. So uh, the plugins provide two commands. Uh, add a pod to a network, remove a pod to a network. It's, it's very simple, actually. And the plugins care about uh, everything, like allocating the IPs and setting up, uh, talking to backend and, and so on. So this is an example of a CNI configuration. Uh, this, this network, MyNet, is for, of type point-to-point, -point, and then it, it defines uh, uh, IP, uh, an IP subrange, a uh, 24 IP subrange, subnet. And yeah, basically you do rocket run net, this net, and a container image, and then boom, you have your, your pod with this network, and then you can connect all the pods together in this way. And the way this works, for a bit more technical explanation, Rocket creates a network namespace, and then it executes this, this uh, CNI plugin, which deals with setting up everything via set NS calls and netlink sockets. And then Rocket uh, runs systemd and spawn inside this network namespace. So this pod will, will run within this network. OK? So uh, that was the introduction on, on Rocket. And I want to talk about Rocket and, and Kubernetes. So for those of you who don't know Kubernetes, it's basically an abstraction layer that abstracts uh, containers over a cluster. So basically, you have an API entry point, and you can say, OK, run this image uh, five times. And Kubernetes will deal with uh, scheduling this image in uh, a node that considers convenient. And it will uh, also handle all the requests to the service and, and send it to the, to the correct node. So how can Rocket help Kubernetes? Or how can we think Rocket can help Kubernetes? There's two ways. You can use Rocket as the container runtime for Kubernetes. This is what we call Rocket Natives. Or you can use Rocket to actually run the Kubernetes, uh, which uh, uses a feature of Rocket called Rocket Fly. So first, let's talk about uh, Rocket Natives. So on each of these, those nodes I described before, there's this software called the Kubelet, which uh, is actually what runs the container images on the node, deals with run, uh, having a node running a container image. And it provides a runtime interface with some method calls, sync pod, get pod, kill pod. So in theory, anyone can implement this and uh, use whatever container runtime you, you want. But of course, uh, Kubernetes started using Rocket, uh, Docker from the beginning, sorry. So uh, even if you try to make an abstract uh, a layer, it's kind of hard. So there's a lot of Docker assumptions, of course. So this is how the way it worked uh, on Docker before 1.11. The kubelet will start the Docker daemon, and then it will talk to the Docker daemon to spawn all the containers it needs, or to get all the information of the containers. Um, this has some, some problems. Docker doesn't understand pods, which is a concept that's also present in, in Kubernetes. So it has to maintain a map between uh, a pod and which containers it, it contains, uh, which is yeah, kind of uh, a hack, I would say. And it, it needs to use this so-called infra container to hold a namespace for a pod, which is, we think, is also a bit of a hack. And uh, the problem is that if, if the Docker daemon dies, all your containers go away. So then uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a big problem. So you have to restart everything. And uh, uh, yeah, to, to finish, Docker doesn't interact well with systemd, which a lot of people want to use. And after, I mean, in 1.11, which is the latest release, they introduced this containerd uh, um, part that actually start the containers. So the kubelet will talk to Dockerd, and Dockerd will talk to Containerd, and that will st start all the containers with a shim that is managing the container, and it can reattach the container to Containerd if, if it dies. So Dockerd is no longer a single point of failure, but for now Containerd is. If Containerd dies, you, your uh, containers will go away. But in the future, after 1.12 or latest releases, uh, they would like to, to have this upgrading of a daemon without restarting the containers. There's an issue about it. Uh, but still, you have all this per-container overhead, which is this shim that deals with reattaching. 
and there's a lot of moving parts, right? You, you have uh, a daemon that spawns containers, and then when the, it dies and it starts again, it reattaches. It's kind of uh, weird. So um, using the kubelet with Rocket, we think makes a lot of sense. Rocket has the, uh, a button, it's a pot neighbor runtime, right? It has this pot concept. And it, it has also first integration, first class integration with systemd hosts. And it, ha it is, since it, is a, it has self -contained, uh, a self-contained pod process model, there's no single point of failure because each container is a, a process and it doesn't have a daemon controlling them. And also it has multi-image compatibility uh, with this Docker to ACI software that, uh, so we can run Docker images on Rocket, so they should be uh, transparently swappable and you should have no user impact. So how does it work? Pray Rocket Natives, Kubelet talks to Docker daemon for all talks, as I said. And with Rocket Natives, uh, Kubelet talks to the API service to get all the information on pods. And Kubelet accepts Rocket for some preparatory tasks. And the Kubelet also talks to systemd to actually start the pods. So it will look something like this. So in this instance, is if, you, if the Kubelet dies, it doesn't matter. Your pods will continue running. If the API service dies, it doesn't matter. The kubelet won't get information until it gets restarted. And once it gets restarted, we'll, it, it will work fine. If uh, a, a pod dies, it doesn't matter to the rest of the pods. And if systemd dies, then you are fucked anyway. So, <laughs> so the benefit in this is, again, no daemon running the containers. You can upgrade the container runtime and just the new containers will use the new version. The old containers will continue using the old version. There's, there will be no problem. And this uh, stage one composability thing I was talking before, it, it gives a great advantage because you can decide which pods should have more isolation or less. And it integrates, integrates seamlessly, seamlessly with systemd. So machine CTL, system CTL, or the, these commands just work. Um, so OK, when can you use it? Uh, we're aiming for an unofficial release on the Kubernetes 1.3. That is late June, so late this month. And right now we have uh, yeah, more than 90% of end-to-end -to -end tests passing. Uh, I don't know the exact figure, but we are very, very close. And yeah, you can still try it before the official release, although maybe it's better to wait a bit more since it's so close uh, using those URLs there. And watch the rocketnetis.io space. We'll have some updates soon. So the second way to uh, the second way in which Rocket loves Kubernetes is using Rocket to run Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is mostly a self-hosting uh, um, project, but not entirely. There, there needs to be a way to bootstrap this Kubelet uh, software on each node, and then when you have the Kubelet uh, bootstrap, then uh, this can host the control plane, plane elements. So in, in CoreOS, uh, everything is a container, if, if you don't know it yet. But yeah, the kubelet is kind of hard to run in a container because it does some things to the host that are not uh, yeah, very containerizable, if that's a word. So mounting volumes on the host and doing all the kind of changes there. So we introduced this fly feature on Rocket, which is unlike Rocket Run, instead of running pods, it just runs an app. It's unconstrained, there's no isolation, there's nothing. But the good thing is that you, you can take advantage of other features of Rocket, like the image uh, uh, discovery, image verification, and image management. So we think that's pretty neat. So this is the, the old image of Rocket running pods. And now, instead of having the pod, you have an application. And this application can be the kubelet. And uh, with that, you can bootstrap Kubernetes and you can update it using uh, all the Rocket features for Im image management. Okay, so after 1.0, uh, Kubernetes after 1.3 wants to reward the runtime interface of the of the kubelet, and it, they want to have finer grain control over containers. So they, they want to move away from uh, a monolithic function sync pod and have some more fine-grained functions, like uh, managing con containers on a pod. So um, Rocket can do that easily with leveraging systemd. 
uh, if you want to, I don't know, show the logs for a for a for a pod, uh, you do general detail dash m pod name. If you want to filter via app, you use dash u. It's pretty easy. Or you can start uh, or restart apps in a pod uh, just by using uh, system detail dash m pod name and then start what app. So we still have the benefit of first class pods, and we can also manage single containers in a in a pod. And another thing that we want to introduce is the OCI image format. Uh, it's something, some image format that we, we can all agree on instead of using either ACI or, or the Docker format. And we are currently working on, on tooling, OC tools, so you can manage your OCI images. And we will try to push this image format to Kubernetes so we can all share, share a, a, an image format. OK, that was Rocket Netis, and uh, now let's, let's talk about what's, what happened since 1.0 on Rocket. Well, of course, lo lots of bug fixes. Uh, we had a lot of reports, a uh, lot of people trying to use Rocket after 1.0, and thanks everybody for reporting issues. And we have some features like uh, app exit status propagation. This was a pretty requested feature. So if an app exits, and uh, now you can have the exit status of, of that app instead of just having zero. Like happened before, and we can we ship now stage one images from the CoreOS website. So now it's very easy to try a new stage one with KVM or or the Fly stage one. And um, yeah, I would like to do a demo, but unfortunately I don't have internet. <laughs> but yeah, you can just ro rocket run stage one name and put KVM, and then you can have that downloaded automatically. And lots of Rocket Netis fixes. Uh, so uh, we've been working closely with a team that, that uh, is integrating Rocket in Kubernetes. Uh, and whatever they need, we, we just fix it, like host name to be able to specify a host name per pod, uh, some kind of uh, hack so we can implement the, the Docker volume semantics, and improvements in the APN service, and many more. As I said before, AC Linux support on Fedora. We, we need, we've been uh, being helped by the Red Hat team working on this because I don't know if you understand as Linux, but I don't. And uh, concurrent image, image fetching, so you can fetch the same image concurrently. And one thing I'm pretty excited about is uh, the using a pure systemd in stage one, because before we had some wrapper uh, binaries, so we couldn't actually benefit from the security features of systemd inside a pod. So now we have a lot of things here. We can. Ah, thank you. Um, we can uh, restrict per uh, per app the capabilities. We can uh, have read-only root FS. We can we can uh, uh, have a per app mount namespace, so it's easy, it's more difficult to escape. Uh, we can restrict access to dangerous files. We can have this no new privileges uh, uh, new feature of the Linux kernel that doesn't let you run set UID binaries, doesn't let the binaries gain new privileges. And all this is very easy because we just need a new line in, in the service file of, of each app, and it's just implemented, and it's great because the systemd guys maintain that, and you don't, and you don't have to, to do that yourself, so we're not reinventing uh, the wheel. Um, and testing. Testing is very important. We have a, a pretty comprehensive functional testing uh, a suite, but the problem is we were using Semaphore CI. That's a, a service that gives you basically a, sort of a, a, a VM, so you can run uh, your your things there. And we needed a VM because we need access to low-level things, and a, a container won't work like most uh, continuous integration services use. Uh, but the problem was that they were only using uh, an old Ubuntu. I think it was 14.04 or something like that. And we couldn't try new features that we implemented in Rocket, like user namespaces or, or the overlay file system. So that wasn't uh, helping us. So now we are building a, a custom Jenkins uh, testing. And we want to test Rocket with several configurations in several versions of several uh, uh, distributions. And all at the same time. So we are pretty close. And we will integrate it soon. And yeah, what's next now? Of course, the OCI image format, as I, as I said before. And it's not yet 1.0, but when it is, we will implement it in Rocket. 
So we can all share a, a format, Docker, Rocket, and, and whatever container runtimes show up in the future. Um, C group uh, two and C group namespace list, those are new uh, features in the kernel that improve on the previous C groups uh, uh, subsystems. And we have a contributor that already did most of the work, but we are still working. Uh, well, the kernel doesn't have support for the CPU C group, so that means you could you cannot still control the CPU usage of your containers with this new API. So we'll have to wait for that. And Rocketfly is a stage one, but we would like to make it a top uh, level command. So because it, it's not really the same as 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 a, a container. Uh, IPv6 support on CNI. Uh, uh, I think even today they're, they're still they're, they're working on, on it, and I think it will be there pretty soon. Full S Linux enforcing on Fedora. They need to fix this this kernel bug I was talking about before, so we can run in a Fedora uh, with S Linux enabled if somebody uses that. And rocket stop. Uh, instead of if you don't rely on your init system to start the rocket pods, uh, there's no there was no easy way to stop a pod. Uh, but with Rocket Stop, we will we will be able to do that. Um, a stable API, uh, this API I was talking about before, that's also a goal for us. But we are kind of waiting on Kubernetes to see what what it needs uh, until freezing it. Rocket Kubernetes 1.0, of course. Uh, more, more, more bug fixes. Please report all the issues and uh, up level seccom support. So I don't know if you know what SecCom is, but it's a way to restrict uh, system calls. So you can say that your container cannot open files, for example, and then all the calls to open will fail. And we are um, there's a draft on the spec to define this, and yeah, we are almost there on the implementation. And of course, VM improvements and this new QM stage one that uh, we wanna we're pretty excited to know what the performance is and how it works. So well, before doing this, now that I have a password, maybe I can do a demo. Uh, well, this is very small. Wi-Fi, can you connect to the upstairs Wi-Fi? Yeah, I'm here. All right, oh, here you go. Okay, yeah, I tried a password I had before, but it didn't work. Okay, now it seems to work. Okay, can you see all right? Okay, so I just wanted to show how running Rocket works. So I will use etcd. And <laughs> we need a V. And yeah, that's etcd running. So. I want to show, well, you cannot really see it, but this is the rocket process, well, the pseudo process that starts uh, systemd and spawn, so you can see that this is a container. But now I wanted to show the stage one of KVM. Discovery fail. Do I have internet? Yep. Okay, I guess the demo effect. Okay, I had used this command uh, before, I must have made a typo or something. So this is the KVM uh, stage one, and you can see that it's pretty fucking fast. Uh, it's a full VM, and I was pretty surprised when I tried this. And yeah, I can show you that now the rocket that's running, it doesn't have any spawn anymore, it has KVM. So yeah, I think we think that that's pretty neat. And yeah, then your usual commands, you can list the, the pods, you can list the images I have. Yeah. And so I was just, I just wanted to do a quick demo about that. 
So yeah, too long don't, didn't read. Uh, use Rocket, uh, try Rocket, please give us feedback. Use Rocket and Kubernetes when it's ready. And get involved, file issues, send PRs. And every two weeks we do a, a community sync where we decide, um, yeah, we discuss topics and we decide what's going, coming on next on Rocket. So you, you are welcome to join it and, and ask questions there. Um, and you can find information about it in the Rocket Dev uh, Google Groups. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions? Hello. Yeah. Uh, I, I am a Mesos user, and like I see Rocket does actually solve some of, uh, some of the networking problems Mesos was uh, currently having. Uh, about uh, IP per container or whatever, uh, is is Rocket uh, does Rocket have uh, Mesos integration in its roadmap other than Kubernetes? Mm, no, not at the moment. Uh, I think the Mesos guys were working on using the image format of Rocket, um, but yeah, now with the open container image format, I guess they will use that. But uh, using the actual runtime, uh, there's no support. I'm not sure about the, a CNI plugin for Mesosphere, but yeah, I have no idea. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, and sorry if it was uh, very technical. I, I don't know <laughs> if it, it was too technical for the audience, but yeah, thanks anyway. We have a coffee break now. Uh, you can get Wi-Fi passwords from Borsa Istanbul desk just in the foyer. And we'll be expecting you back at 11.40.